The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! Women empower women. We're daughters, wives, sisters, and mothers making strides in our own lives. We're women in sports, and what matters to you matters to us. Let's talk about it all on The Playmaker. Here's your host, Nikki Harrison. Welcome to The Playmaker. I'm Nikki Harrison, and it has been a while. I mean, it's been a long time since I've done this. So I hope everyone is healthy, safe, and doing well. Um, So it's Women's History Month, and I get the opportunity to chat with some ladies who are some trailblazers and breaking down barriers in sports. And joining me today is Kalisha Stewart, Associate Counsel for the Dallas Cowboys, and Dr. Yolanda Brooks, Clinical and Sports Psychologist and Mental Health Consultant for the Dallas Cowboys. Thank you, ladies, so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Of course. So let's just jump right into it. Um, First off, I want to talk about your roles with the Dallas Cowboys and what your work entails. Kalisha, I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Again, thank you for having me. So excited to be here. So I'm heading into my sixth season with the Cowboys as associate counsel. And so that means that I help review and negotiate all sorts of contracts from uh, employment agreements to vendor agreements, sponsorship agreements, all sorts of things like that. Um, I help solve disputes. Um, I do sort of general legal advising. And really, my role is to help the Cowboys organization do what it wants to do all while managing risk. That's so awesome. I can only imagine it was your family and friends hitting you up. Um, like, when's the DAC deal going to get done? When's the DAC deal going to get done? Oh, relentlessly. <laughs> 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 and Dr. Brooks, what's your what's your role and what does your work entail? Well, uh, this is my uh, starting my second season back with the Cowboys. I was with them seven years before. Um, and this role is a little different, although it overlaps some of the things I did before. Right now, my emphasis is helping the stress management component of the organization proactively as well as reactively. That includes um, making sure the players as well as the coaches are um, not overwhelming themselves, taking care of themselves, eating, sleeping, uh, relationships are all healthy. And given with the daily adjustments with the COVID situation, it's been um, a new adventure every day. Uh, Being a source of support, a sounding board, and a consultant when we do crisis, Um, I take the helm with my uh, team of emergency responders, and uh, we do deal with critical critical incidents, as well as um, provide support to family members throughout the organization if necessary, but mostly focused on coaches and players. And and lastly, just um, being a sounding board for people to come in Mm -hmm. and get things off their chest. That's fabulous. Now, um, basically, you, you, it sounds like you just keep everything balanced because there's so much that are, that are thrown at, at, at the athletes and the coaches and, and everyone. Now, what led you to sports? Dr. Brooks, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, some people came after me and uh, captured me kicking and screaming and made me come. Um, <laughs> uh, not too 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 far from, um, from that. Um, actually, it was a convergence of a number of events in my private practice that um, my name kept coming up because of work I had done in the community, as well as in my clinical practice. And a few of the people I worked with were connected to sports. Um, surprisingly, not football, and uh, it intersected with. Uh, legal aspects as well as just um, parenting and coping with high stress, high pro- hope, high profile situations. Um, I had been establishing programs for other corporations through like employee assistance and uh, that led them to my door and I was invited to come in to uh, establish a program many years ago and uh, that's how I got my start. Um, with this organization, as well as with a, sub, a couple of others at the same time. Okay. And what about you, Kalisha? Was sports always on your path? 
Well, I knew that I wanted to work for a company that, you know, connected really deeply with its consumers. Um, and I got a taste of that working at Nike, um, which is just a beloved brand and actually is one of our key sort of foundational partners here at the Cowboys. Um, but when I worked for Nike, I lived in Oregon. I worked at their world headquarters in Beaverton. And there, there was just, you know, this sort of certain energy and enthusiasm among the employees that I think was part of a real feedback loop from the energy and enthusiasm that we, you know, kind of got from our consumers who love the products. And I really was drawn to that. And sports also provides a similar opportunity for that connection to consumers. And I'm drawn to being part of an organization that people feel passionately about. Um, and it, it really gives the work meaning for me. Um, for example, I've actually always been really blown away by how our fans show their loyalty. Of course, coming to our games, but they get Cowboy stars tattooed on their bodies. Um, they paint the cowboy star on their cars and on their homes. And you know, we get this a lot. Actually, people often request to put the cowboy star on headstones, um, which to me is just a, a, a symbol of how much this organization means to some of our fans, and and that's just really touching. And so that's that's what I love about about the work and what what drew me to sports in particular. Wow, for sure. I, wow, I can't for sure. I I I I've ever heard that. <laughs> That's fascinating. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, uh, working in sports, specifically the NFL, and both of you have come from different industries, is how is working in the NFL different from those industries? Kalisha, I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So the NFL is unique in a lot of ways. Uh, for one, I would say it's cultural relevance. So it's the most watched broadcast TV by a mile. Um, I saw a stat that NFL games accounted for 70 of the top 100 broadcast shows in 2020 by way of uh, viewership. So the league is, is just on its own in terms of um, fan engagement and fan interest. And to me, the implication of that and how that impacts my work is that, you know, the work that we do can be hugely impactful on the life of our fans and on our communities. And that adds a layer of responsibility that I'm really drawn to. And I feel proud to be part of an organization that has that influence in our community. Definitely. And for you, Dr. Brooks, I mean, yes, you're, this is the NFL, but you get to work with like the players and the coaches on a more personal level. What, what is that like for you? Um, it's not unlike dealing with any other population. Um, the issues are just like everyday people. And even though the layers of stress are far more, um, coaches never sleep, they never eat. They're always in the game, it seems mm -hmm. like. But they have families, they have feelings, they have crises like everyone else. And we certainly know that experience, sadly. Um, in our organization, but we uh, all band together like a big family. And that's one of the big draws that I have is that this is an organization that's family owned and run. So family is very important. And I do think that's been a priority uh, before. And that certainly stands true now. Um, being supportive of one another as if there's, they're part of the families, even when they leave and they're no longer a cowboy, there's still that sense of connectedness. So that's a huge part of the draw for me. That's one of the main differences is the closeness. Everyone is here in the building um, a lot of time. They spend a lot of time together. So it is is more like a family. And um, that's something I value. Uh, also the dedication the support, the interest in one another, not just of the sport, but also of the community, I think is um, very relevant to me. And um, organiz organiz organizationally, it's more than just the game that I uh, embrace as well. Wow, I love that you said that about family because that is so true. I mean, even in, in, with the work that I do, I mean, it feels like we're such a huge family. And you're right, we spend so much time together. It, we sometimes spend more time with each other than we do our actual family. So you're so right about that. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and just talk about women in general in sports. Um, 
there have been some changes and some women breaking down some doors. I mean, we have female coaches, coaching assistants, and um, uh, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, referees and officials with Sarah Thomas and, and uh, Maya Chaka, the first uh, black female official, which is so awesome. And even more women in the front office in different leagues, like in the NBA with St. Marshall with the Dallas Mavericks and in baseball. What are your thoughts on these on these trailblazers doing what they do? It's so awesome. Kalisha, I'll start with you. Yeah, it it really means a lot to me. I, I'm I'm so proud to be a woman working in sports and in football in particular. Um, but I also feel increasingly less special in just the best way. And and what I mean by that is there's just simply more of us at the table than there used to be. And, you know, as I mentioned, I'm only going to my sixth season. I've seen amazing changes in that relatively, you know, short period of time in the grand scheme of things. So, for example, you know, when I started at the Cowboys, I noticed that I was the only black attorney at our, a woman attorney at our annual NFL club council meeting, which is just a really fun summit of all the attorneys um, at the various NFL teams. Um, I noticed that, you know, I was the only black woman there. And over the past, you know, five years, five and a half years or so, I've seen that number grow. And that's really exciting to me um, because women bring so much value to an organization. And I think we're all better off when there are women in positions of influence. Um, I think the natural entry point for women um, has been roles in the front office, areas like legal and HR. And that's really important for women to hold those positions of power because they can make such an impact on the business and on employees. But to see women, you know, you mentioned Jennifer King and, and Maya Chaka on the football side is completely inspiring. I mean, I think it shows the recognition that women have a place everywhere. You know, we belong and add value to every corner of the sports business. And so that's very exciting to see that recognition and see that translate to women having these important roles. Totally, totally. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Brooks? Yes, I agree. However, um, I believe women have always been a part, an instrumental part of this industry, but only recently have they been recognized in a formal way. But if you look back over the history, women have been in the background, the true hidden figures with coaches, the owners, um, you know, the, the players, the family members. And I know when I was first brought into this organization, um, the owner being the marketer that he is, recognized the value of having a woman and even a woman of color that they brought a different dynamic and that's something that other teams began to recognize from that example, not just in the locker room, but in the front office and in other leagues as well. So when you establish um, a template or you have other people recognize a certain perspective that they hadn't recognized before, this is a copycat industry as well. Others began to do that. And uh, I do think that that's important. It adds value and women certainly add value in numerous ways. So this second go around, how many women that I see and how many women are in positions of authority and power that are far reaching beyond the building itself. Um, so there's always room for more, obviously, but I do think that it's, um, reflection of growth, at least in my compared and contrasted from my first go round to coming back years later and seeing how things are now. Absolutely. And I mean, let's just think, okay, so like the Rooney rule, um, it was implemented for uh, teams to then be required to interview minority candidates for head coaching positions and senior positions in football operations since representation matters we see that and we're seeing women in different roles do we think that something like that may happen in the future as more and more women um enter the field what are your what are your thoughts on that kalisha um so the the prospect of having the rooney rule extend to um to include women and or, or mm -hmm. cover a broader, well, I I think um, I think it's certainly 
possible. And with these, you know, folks like Jennifer King, as we mentioned, you know, really representing uh, being a woman on the coaching staff and how that can be very successful and added to the, to the team. I, I do see value there for sure. Um, and the Rooney role has a very important role in our clubs and in the development of leadership in our clubs, but it can't, it's not enough. And I think that um, having a pipeline of qualified women from top to bottom is really key in order to get that representation and ensure that it's lasting and it's not just a flash in the pan. But to answer your specific question, yeah, I, I think it's it's certainly possible. Um, and I do think that one of the, the great benefits of the Rooney Rule is even though it, it applies in certain specific contexts, it provided signaling to the clubs about what the NFL's expectation was in terms of how we're going about our hiring practices. It helps set a good example for how we look at all sorts of uh, filling all sorts of positions on the front office and otherwise, and making sure that we have a diverse slate of candidates. I think we could thank the Rooney Rule for that, for making that a priority. But again, it's going to take even more in order to get the type of representation that we want. Um, the last thing I'll say is we really, in terms of getting the type of representation that we want, we can't forget that half of NFL fans are women and we want to make sure our organizations reflect the customers that we're wanting to serve and engage with. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to switch topics a little bit. I want to talk about mental health. I know you will love this, Dr. Brooks. <laughs> so um, I feel like this past year, 2020, um, just those two words, mental health, became very popular. And it was like it, it was under a microscope. We were told to focus on it and understand the importance of it. Um, why do you think, Dr. Brooks, it is so important to have someone like you working for an organization such as the Dallas Cowboys with your expertise? Well, I think that there are a number of reasons and teams have had people like me in place. They may not have been in the role that I've had. I do think this organization has been in the forefront of uh, focusing on that when they brought me in back in the 90s. And um, from that, it's grown to, into other leagues and teams as well outside of the NBA, N NFL. So I think that uh, this team needs to be credited for recognizing the value and importance of that first and foremost. But mental health, mental wellness is the key that drives the ignition of life. If you don't pay attention to your mental health, the rest of you doesn't work very well. And we need a balance and a connection of both mind and body and to have a healthy relationship between the two. So your mind can tell you all kinds of things, but it has to be the partnership between the two to make the body work. Our, our, we are just miraculous entities in how we work. I mean, magnificent machines, but unless we learn to cooperate with ourselves, and uh, take care of our bodies as well as our minds, it's not going to work. I think the value of that has become more noticeable and more um, reflective of our society. COVID ex certainly exposed that, but the traumatic situations that we dealt with during the past season certainly um, thrust into the spotlight the importance and value of having someone with my skill sets, but also a team that could work together because no one person can work alone. And so the people on the team that I worked with helped to make it better than, uh, be help the situation that was devastating and very traumatic, more manageable and understanding why we need to have time off to take care of ourselves, to recover, to reflect, to recuperate and before we move forward. Mm. That's so good. Oh my goodness, that is so good. Kalisha, would you like to add anything? Oh gosh, I don't know that I have anything more to add other than I. <laughs> we have to cooperate with ourselves. Is a That was like a mind blowing quote to hear. That's so true. Um, yes. But just speaking as a, a lay person, you know, my view is that mental health, it simply must be prioritized the same way we prioritize other more physical aspects of our, of our health, you know, 
just like a twisted ankle would impact your ability to go about your, your normal day, uh, when our mental health suffers, our ability to go about our lives and maximize our potential is, is very impacted. So I think really just recognizing the importance of valuing that is, is so key. And, and I'm very heartened to see that um, as a greater society, we're, we're moving more in that direction. You know, therapy being more common and, and more talked about even, um, I think is, is a great step, it's, it's critical. And don't you love that it, like I said, it is no longer a taboo and you're seeing things like mm -hmm. mental health is self-care. I mean, I, I like to think during the pandemic, a day could be just a series of feelings. I mean, in that day, you'd feel mm -hmm. anger, sadness, happy, crying. It was, it was absolutely crazy, but knowing that mm -hmm. it's okay and we can talk about it. And there are people like Dr. Brooks that we, you can talk to yeah. about it. <laughs> well, Absolutely. you know, the, the, the important thing I'd like to add to, if I, if I may, is that, you know, there is still stigma around people like me. Mm -hmm. But what I try to do is educate people to not normalize something that's abnormal. <laughs> and prolonged mm -hmm. exposure to stress and not addressing it is not normal. And so our bodies physically and physiologically begin to respond to that. And we ignore that. You know, you get a headache or your stomach's growling because you're hungry and you go ahead and still don't eat. There's gonna be a price to pay for that. Our bodies tell us what's going on and we choose to ignore it. That's why that mind-body relationship has to work and sync together. But the other aspect I think is really important is that we, have these hidden issues that's easy to hide, but you can't hide a broken leg or a broken wrist or something like that. But it's no less as of, of importance to seek immediate evaluation to determine where you are on that continuum. When you have a bad day, it's a bad day. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're yeah. mentally ill. But if you have a series of them over a period of time that get more in tense and become more severe over a period, that's not to be ignored. But we want to ignore that because we are often afraid to find out what's really going on and that's to our detriment. So a lot mm -hmm. of what I do is called psychoeducation is to teach you about the mind because you can hide it, you don't have to look at it, you can try to ignore it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And you don't want it to metastasize into something more serious because you've been ignoring it. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yes. You're, wow. All right. Well, what we were just mm -hmm. talking about this past year has really taught us a lot. And what is something that um, this past year has taught you about yourself and about the human spirit? Kalisha, you can go first. Gosh, well, I mean, I hope this isn't too uh, surface level, but one thing is that I'm I'm actually okay with video conferencing. You know, before COVID, <laughs> I would never be one to, 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 like, why would I turn on my video camera? That's just silly. Like, why would, why would we do that? But, you know, I think that, you know, adapting to that has brought a lot of great benefits. Um, for example, um, just last night, we had a a really nice uh, happy hour with people from the league office and across many NFL teams. And it was a really great way to meet people around the country that are doing similar work at their own home clubs. And, you know, I think before COVID, the idea of a virtual happy hour sounded awful. Um, but now, you know, I think that, you know, adapting to that and, and being open to connecting in these new ways has, has really added a lot of value to my life. And so it's kind of like, you know, maybe be even more open to new ways of doing things. And just because we've done things a certain way, um, you know, all along doesn't mean we have to keep going that route. You know, when, when COVID hit, as part of my role in legal, we had to evaluate our operations from top to bottom to make sure that we were implementing new practices and policies that were protecting not only our fans, but our employees and our vendors and our, our guests at, at the star and, and at the stadium. And so sometimes when there's a big upheaval like COVID, 
you, you got to do that for yourself too of like okay let me just reevaluate what's going on and see what's serving me and what's not and and i think covid has really shown me that in a really tangible way in a way that touched my work and my personal life Wow. I, yes, I can only imagine oh, yeah. conversations were like when it when you had to think about just how you did a, everyday business because everything changed. Absolutely. Yes. What are your thoughts, Dr. Brooks? Well, I think Kalisha really said uh, really hit on some very good key points, and I'll just expand on a couple of them. Number one, I learned to slow down, be reflective, and say no. Uh, Self-care is not being selfish. It's taking care of the only thing I've got, which is me, and I'm with me 24-7. And it's okay back and take care of me. And I learned to do that. I also learned that I can go to bed today and wake up tomorrow and be a whole different world. And uh, that, with that being said, the connection to those I love, however it is, just a call, how are you doing, or a text message, um, that's something that moved to the forefront in my life and how I did it. Just because I can't be physically with you doesn't mean I can't be with you, whether it's by video, by just making a connection. And I reinforce that with others as well, because what therapy is, is therapeutic. It's talking, it's sharing. And that's why we have a ritual society of gathering is because we are not people. We're not creatures that are designed to be isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. We are people that are meant to be interconnected. And that's what COVID robbed us of being physically together, but we learned other ways to do it. Now we're having conversations at the dinner table. We're having to share space diplomatically so we can tolerate each other and be together. Um, you know, I personally had four teleworkers in my house, two dogs and a little toddler running around, and we had to come up with a system to coexist. And uh, it was great. Imagine that when I, they were teenagers, it didn't work. But now as adults, we found a way to get along. And that's what you discover, other facets of yourself that become more of a priority. The social media, the texting and telephone, that's not as important as just being with the people that you're with at the moment, being present. And you're hearing more of that, being mindful, being in the present, because tomorrow's not promised. Oh, that is so true. I love all of that. And I love that you both took something from from 2020 and, and made it positive. And you're going to keep it around or you'd like to keep it around. I, I love that because I did the same thing. I have two little ones and I was a substitute teacher and short order cook trying to do my job all at the same time. So yeah, it's been it's been fun. <laughs> so um, one thing that's awesome about working for the Dallas Cowboys, we know we all have titles but that literally is just a title. We do so much more other than what our job entails. And what's so awesome about the two of you is you use your expertise and professionalism and are involved, have been invited to participate in discussions and panels that are all about empowering women. And Kalisha, you were a part of one in February with WISE DFW, and that stands for Women in Sports and Events. And you were a part of a coffee collaboration. What was that all about? Tell us. Oh, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So Wise DFW, it's a chapter of a, a larger organization that focuses on, it's a professional association of women who work in sports and entertainment and events. And that, so it was a partnership uh, with someone from the Mavericks, Ivy Awino, and it was an honor to talk with her and um, share some of the things we were doing in the diversity and inclusion space. And it was really interesting to have that conversation with Ivy in particular, because the Mavericks are really a gold standard for um, how they've uh, address diversity and inclusion issues and how they've really um, focused on social justice under the leadership of St. Marshall. And so they're really advanced and far along in their journey and there's so much that we can learn from them. Um, and the Cowboys, we are, we've been, we've had a, a commitment to social justice and diversity for a long time, but like many companies in the summer of 2020, we really did some, some soul searching and, and thought, um, 
thought carefully about what more can we do and how can we lend our voice to these important issues and the organization has been extremely supportive of the work that we've done we've launched an employee resource group called the fellowship that is dedicated to supporting and developing black employees, but also to providing educational and engagement opportunities for all Dallas Cowboys employees, and to really use our platform to advocate for social justice through um, community service and other community engagement. So it's it was really interesting to see a company or to discuss a company that's, that's very far along on this journey and is really setting an example for the sports industry and to share some of the things that we're doing um, to advance our position as it relates to, to these issues and to share how a company might uh, amplify its efforts in these areas. So that was really special. I appreciate you bringing that up. No, of course. It, it, it's so important because I know, like you said, this summer, a lot of companies had to look internally and see how they were handling things. Now, Dr. Brooks, you were here recently, a part of a panel for Black, uh, what is it? Let's see here. Black Sports Hidden Professionals. Figures. Hidden mm -hmm. Figures. Now, tell us what that was all about. Well, um, I was invited last year just as COVID was... Um, coming to surge forth and uh, they had to postpone it. So this was a, uh, a redo of it with the same panelist. Um, before I get off into that real quickly, I would just like to say what a dynamo Kalisha has been and what she's doing with the organization and in the community. Yes. Um, she's a hidden figure for sure. Um, so uh, I, I just want to commend her with that. I'll get to you next. Uh, Nikki, but let me get back focused. I had to say that before I forgot. Um, <laughs> but the hidden yeah. figures really, um, I was so impressed with the other panelists. I, I, I find that I love doing some of these uh, activities. I learn so much about other people, most of them younger, and what they're accomplishing at this stage and phase of life. And uh, I'm so proud. <laughs> I'm really so proud of them. Uh, I, I, I the, the hidden figures are really the people behind the scenes, but they are surging forth with what they're doing and enlightening and inspiring others behind them who would like to do what we're doing or want to do something to build upon this platform. And that just, just thrills me. Um, obviously, I didn't get to where I am by myself. There were people who we're pushing from behind, the wind beneath my wings, opening the doors, or maybe pulling me, kicking and screaming. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I recognize retrospectively that all of these pieces were part of a bigger picture and a bigger plan, none of my design. But as a woman of faith, sometimes you have to be still and the things that you want are right in front of you. They may not be in the packaging you expect or in the situation you were looking for, but I can honestly say in a lot of instances, it's even better. And uh, we have to learn to be patient. We have to learn to be reflective and to be still. And so the Hidden Figures was a discussion by some of the women in corporate, former athletes, current athletes, about what they're doing now, how they transitioned from point A to point B, and what their hope holds for the future using their roles, how they're building upon that, and what they'd like for those coming behind to accomplish. So that gives them something to strive for. It gives them something to look for. So where I may have started, I may have been the ones designing something, the others take that design and improve upon it and make it even bigger. And I can't be more excited about that. Oh, I can only imagine. That's really awesome. Well, that's so great that the both of you lend your time for, for things like that. Because like I said a while back, representation matters. And for yes. young people to see that, you know, a, a career in sports is not just being on the field or on the court or at the mound. Um, there, there's so much that takes place <laughs> behind the scenes. And I'm so glad that you guys get to do that. Well, I'm going to have to wrap soon. But before I do, I want to ask each of you, who are some female influences in your life? Kalisha, I'll start with you. Oh, gosh. Um, 
much. Well, I I have to to start with my my mother. Everything starts with with the mom for sure. She um you know she was a young mom when she had me, but she really dedicated her her life to um, developing us kids and she's the most selfless person I know, the smartest person I know and she I everything that I've become has been because of her and to to support her and and to make her happy. So I have to go with my mom. Oh, I love it. That's fabulous. What about you, Dr. Brooks? Well, um, obviously my mom, but I must uh, add another mother, Mother Mary, um, a woman of faith and someone that um, I hold in high esteem as well, faithfully. Uh, the, the women of my village in Richmond, Virginia, they are my surrogate mothers. And then professionally, um, there are three that I can really say have, have held my hand and and made me sit down and listen. Uh, one is Janet Hill, the wife of Calvin Hill, the mother of Grant Hill. The other is Beverly Warfield. She's the wife of Paul Warfield, Hall of Famer from the undefeated Miami Dolphins team. And uh, last but not least, Margaret Jordan, who is a local icon in the health business, health uh, industry here. She was the first black nurse to graduate from uh, Georgetown University, but she's worked mostly on the business side, and uh, she's been a mentor and supporter in the Dallas-Fort Worth community. That's awesome. Well, I have to say, the two of you truly inspire me. Oh, did you say what about me? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I would definitely say my mom, um, and my mom, she's just a fabulous woman, smart, beautiful, and I know I've said this a thousand times, but the older I get, the more right she is about everything. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> but uh, what I was saying is you, the two of you truly inspire me. Every time I get the opportunity to talk to you both, to have a conversation, I leave so inspired and so full. So I thank you, Kalisha. I thank you, Dr. Brooks, for joining me today as we honor Women's History Month. I'm going to wrap it up. I also have to, of course, thank producer Chris for making it happen. Um, do you have any closing statements you'd like to say? No, just, is this to know. us? Yes. Uh, I, well, I would like <laughs> to say feedback, one. I'd like to so thank you, Nikki. Um, I'd like to thank you, Nikki, for all that you do um, and all that you have done. Uh, I think you make this look so easy and always well prepared, always so poised. And uh, I didn't realize that you had youngsters. And so I learned something more about you every day, which makes me admire you even more, how you make it so easy. So thank you for this invitation as well. Of course. Thank you. Well, and like I said at the beginning, it's been a while, so I feel like a rookie right now. <laughs> well, again, I thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to The Playmaker, and we will see you next time.